Welcome to My Savior Lives Northland. This program offers you the opportunity to participate in a service of worship led by local pastors and members of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. MSL Northland is locally produced with a message for the world. Welcome to MSL Northland. My name is Pastor Tim Urian and I am pastor of Grace Lutheran Church in Hemming, Minnesota. Today's service is being recorded here at my home church, Grace Lutheran in Hibbing. Our sermon today is going to focus on some of the traditions of Christmas and how we might be able to more use them to further the spreading of God's kingdom and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can watch this service on Venmo at MSL Northland or on our website, mslnorthland.com. We'll be right back after this choir piece. make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us come before God's throne of grace and mercy and ask His forgiveness and prepare our hearts for worship. We say we are without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. I have great and wonderful news for you. Almighty God in his mercy has sent his Son to die for you, and it is for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The first reading for today comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 52, verses 7 through 10. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings the good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Our second reading comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited 
is more ex excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Our gospel reading and the text for our sermon meditation this morning comes from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him not, was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to, came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We confess our common Christian faith to and with each other in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Mercy and peace are yours from God our Father, from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and from the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. In our Gospel reading this morning, we heard how the world did not recognize Christ when He came into the world. The, the world did not receive Him. And that's not true just of the time when Jesus first came to the earth. It's pretty much true today, I think, too, and especially around this time of year. During the Christmas season, I think sometimes we get so hung up with and so involved with the secular celebration of Christmas that sometimes we push Christ onto the back burner and we forget what the whole reason for Christmas is. And it's our responsibility as adults to teach our children because if we don't, they will lose what the meaning of Christmas is. If we do not tell them about why we really celebrate what it is that makes Christmas so special to us and not what the world thinks it is, well then, they're going to lose that and we will lose a whole generation of souls for Christ. I'd like to share with you a piece that is written by one of my favorite theologians, Anonymous. And Anonymous wrote this piece to kind of encourage us to use 
the traditions of Christmas to explain what Christmas is really all about. He writes, Late one Christmas Eve, I sat back, sank back into my chair, tired but content. The kids were in bed, the gifts were wrapped, the milk and cookies were waited by the fireplace for Santa. As I sat back admiring the tree with its decorations, I couldn't help feeling that something, something very important was missing. And it wasn't long before the tiny twinkling tree lights lulled me to sleep. Well, I don't know how long I slept, but all of a sudden I knew I wasn't alone. I opened my eyes and you can't imagine my surprise when I saw Santa Claus himself standing next to my Christmas tree. He was dressed all in fur and from his head to his toe, just as the poems described him. But he was not the jolly old elf of Christmas legend. The man who stood before me looked sad and disappointed, and there were tears in his eyes. Santa, what's wrong, I asked. Why are you crying? It's the children, Santa replied sadly. But the children love you, I said. Oh, I know they love me. They love the gifts that I bring them. But the children of today seem to have somehow missed out on the true spirit of Christmas. It's not really their fault, it's just that the adults, the adults, many of them have been, having been taught themselves, have forgotten to teach the children. Teach them what, I asked. Santa's kind old face became soft and more gentle. His eyes began to shine with something more than tears. He spoke softly. Teach the children. Teach the children the true meaning of Christmas. Teach them the part of Christmas we can see, hear, and touch. That is only the beginning. There is much more, so much more to Christmas than meets the eye. Teach them the symbolism beyond and behind the customs and traditions of Christmas which we now observe. Tell them what they truly represent. Santa paused and reached into his bag and pulled out a tiny Christmas tree and sat, set it on the, man, the mantle. Teach them about the Christmas tree. Green is the second color of Christmas. And the stately evergreen. The stately evergreen with its unchanging color represents the eternal hope of life in Jesus. Its needles point heavenward as a reminder that man, mankind's thoughts should turn heavenward as well. Santa then reached into his bag again and pulled out a tiny, shiny star and placed it on the top of the small tree. The star was the heavenly sign of promise. God promised a Savior for the world, and the star was the sign of the fulfillment of that promise on that night that Jesus Christ was born. Teach the children that God always fulfills, God always keeps His promises, and that wise men still seek Him. Red, said Santa, is the first color of Christmas. He pulled out a tiny red ornament for the tiny tree. Red is deep, it's intense, it's vivid, it's the color of the life-giving blood that flows in our veins. It's the symbol of God's greatest gift to us. Teach the children that Christ gave His life, that Christ shed His blood for them, that they might have eternal life. When they see the color red, it should remind them of God's most wonderful gift. Santa then found a silver bell in his pack and placed it on the tree. Just as lost sheep are guided to safety by the sound of the bell, it continues to ring today to all who will be guided to the fold. Teach the children to follow the shepherd, 
the true shepherd, the good shepherd who gave his life for his sheep. Santa then placed a small candle on the mantle and lit it. The soft glow from its one tiny flame brightened the room. The glow of the candle represents how people can show their thanks to God for the gift of His Son that Christmas Eve so long ago. Teach the children. Teach the children to follow in Christ's footsteps, to go about doing good. Teach them to let their lights shine on the tree like the hundreds of bright shining candles, each of them representing one of God's precious children their light shining for all to see. Again, Santa reached into his bag, and this time he brought out a tiny red and white striped cane. As he hung it on the tree, he said softly, the cane is a stick of white candy. The cane, a stick of white hard candy. We recognize it as a candy cane. But think about what it represents. The white symbolizes the virgin birth and the sinless nature of Jesus. And the hard nature of the candy symbolizes a solid rock, the foundation of the church, the rock of Jesus Christ on which our faith is built. It also symbolizes the firmness of God's promises. The candy cane is in the shape of a J to represent the precious name of Jesus who came to earth to save mankind. Turn it up, and it represents the good shepherd's crook, which he uses to reach down into the ditches of the world to lift out the fallen lamb who, like all sheep, have gone astray. The original candy canes had three small red stripes. These three small red stripes represented the scourging that Jesus received by which we are healed. And it also had one large red stripe, that represented the shed blood of Jesus so that we can have the promise of eternal life. Teach the children. Teach them these things. Santa then brought out a wreath made of fresh fragrant greenery and tied, a, tied with a bright red bow. The bow reminds us of the bond of perfection. The wreath is embodies all good things about Christmas for those with eyes to see and ears to understand. It contains the colors of red and green and the heaven-turned-up needles of the evergreen point our way to heaven. The bow tells the story of goodwill towards all and its color reminds us of Christ's sacrifice. Even its shape is symbolic. Representing the eternity and the eternal nature of God's love. The wreath is in the form of a circle. A circle without beginning or end. These are the things you must teach the children. Well, I ask Santa next, what does that leave you, Santa? Where does that leave you? Well, the tears were now gone from his eyes and a smile broke out over his face. Why, bless you, my dear, he said. I'm only a symbol myself. I represent the spirit of family, of fun and joy, of giving and receiving. If the children are taught these other things, there's no danger I'll ever be forgotten. I think I'm beginning to understand. Well, that's why I came, he said. You're an adult. If you don't teach the children these things, then who will? That piece can, contains a lot of wisdom. It talks about the many traditions that we have and how they are grounded and rooted in Christ. It reminds us how easily we are caught up in the celebration of Christmas. So easily caught up that we forget the reason for the season. We forget the real reason why we celebrate Christmas. I mean, we know, as Christians, we know why we celebrate Christmas. And it is our responsibility, it is our duty to share the true message of Christmas, not only with our children, but with the whole world as well. Still, I 
think we have to acknowledge, at least to some degree, that because of the tradition of Santa Claus, Christmas has become the celebration that it is. As believers, we need to understand that as well. But we also need to understand that because of that, there is a greater opportunity for us to tell the world about Jesus during December than in any other time of the year. Even though Santa may take center stage in the world's celebration of Christmas, we know it's not about Santa. It's about Christ. I mean, it is called Christmas, not Santamus. However, it becomes far too easy to just say, well, I know who the central figure of Christmas is. The true meaning of Christmas is not found in Christmas trees. It's not found in ornaments, wrapped gifts, Santa, and it's not even found in the joy of families coming together. The true meaning of Christmas is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who without him there is no hope. No joy. Christmas is about the fact that God, the almighty incarnate God, the creator of the universe, chose to come to earth as a child, to live as a man, to die on the cross for a fallen human race. But people won't believe that. They won't actually believe it unless they see Christ in our lives, unless they see somehow that we are different, somehow that we celebrate different. If they don't see any difference in how we respond to the Christmas season, then how everybody, if we're no different than everybody else, they aren't going to believe that Jesus is the reason that we celebrate the season. So this year, why not start a new tradition? Use the traditions of Christmas to enter into conversation. Use them to point people to Jesus. We've all heard it, and many of us have probably said it. Don't take Christ out of Christmas. Santa is not my Savior, Jesus is. Don't tell me have happy holidays. It's Christmas. Say Merry Christmas. It's not a holiday tree, it's a Christmas tree. It should be Christmas break, not winter break. And I think that list goes on and on. But I want you to consider this. Think about this for a moment. If that is where our focus is, if that's all we're concerned about, well then, we too are missing the true point of Christmas. You see, Christmas is not about hearing the words that we would like to hear. It's about taking time. Time to quietly reflect on what Jesus Christ means to you, what He means to the church, what He means to the world. And the truth is, that many of our so-called Christmas traditions, well, they can be traced to pagan origins. They may have originated in pagan practices. But I seem to recall a story in Genesis. It's a story about a man named Joseph. Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his brothers, and he ended up becoming second in charge of all of Egypt. And after his father's death, the reunion with his brothers, well, his brothers were fearing for their lives. They feared that Joseph would want to get even with them. But Joseph said to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. What Joseph is in essence saying is God took what you intended for evil. God took what was meant for evil and he turned it around for good. And that's what can be done with many of the celebrations, many of the traditions of Christmas which we practice today. We can turn them around and use them for good to point others to Christ. We take what they're familiar with and use it in a new way to spread the gospel of Christ. Instead of arguing over whether department clerks should say Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays, well, let's seize the opportunity to make a positive impact in 
Share the good news of what Christmas is really about. Use the traditions of Christmas. Use what the secular world is doing to enter into conversations. And as you enter into these conversations, let these things point to Christ. Don't be afraid to celebrate Christmas. Just be willing to see Jesus through the traditions of Christmas and to point it out to your family and friends. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please pray with me the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. My name is Pastor Matt Cole. I'm the pastor of Our Redeemer Lutheran Church here in Cloquet, Minnesota. And I am very privileged to introduce for you today the children of Our Redeemer Lutheran Preschool singing for our friends at Community Memorial Hospital here in Cloquet. Please enjoy. Thank you for joining us in worship today. If you would like more information about a church in your area, or if this program has been a blessing to you, please send comments and contributions to MSL Northland, CO Mount Olive Lutheran Church, 2012 East Superior Street, Duluth, Minnesota, 55812. We appreciate your support and prayers for this ministry. My Savior Lives Northland is a production of Stokes Media House in conjunction with the Wisconsin and Minnesota North Districts of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and supported by viewers like you.